And what can they do? They can talk, and they can move red and blue around, okay? <clears throat> uh, here's here's uh, the instructions are essentially about two-thirds of a page long, okay? And they're told that when the, the clock, there's first the 10 seconds, first 10 seconds, which I've left out here where they produce the red and blue. Then they're told that when the clock expires, over the next 90 second period, you earn cash based upon the number of red and blue items that have been moved to your house. We don't tell them that they have to move them. We don't tell them that it's possible for other people to move stuff into their house that, to discover that. So the point is that what it means to move stuff, uh, they're going to be paid based upon the number of units of red and blue moved into their house by the end of the period, okay? But what that process is and what, how much freedom that gives them, they have to discover by trial and error, by conversation. Okay. Everyone, and they're told that everyone in this experiment can send text messages. Every, everyone can read all posted messages. You send the screen, you can type a message in the chat room, click on the, on the, on the send button, and that sends it to the screen where everybody can see it. Okay. And during the experiment, every seven periods will be a break period in which nobody produces anything, but the chat rooms are still open. Okay, here's the, here are the production opportunity sets uh, of a even, uh, Here's an even fr the even frontier. Person with an even number has this al these alternative amounts of red and blue that he can produce. A people an, an odd individual can produce these uh, alternative uh, amounts. Uh, <coughs> notice that there's and there's economies that's going to pay them to to fully specialize. Okay, and either blue or red, but they have to find that out. Uh, <coughs> Then uh, evens, uh, they have Leontief preferences, okay? So they're going to consume red and blue in fixed proportions. The, uh, the evens, it's two to one, and the, and the reds, it's uh, three to two, okay? If they specialize, they can, what they have to discover is that if I, the, an odd specializing in red needs to find out that he can trade 30 blue, 40 red for 30 blue, and if, if he pairs up with an even that is fully specialized, then uh, the, the ratio is just the reverse of that. Okay, now I'm going to show you. <clears throat> uh, we started out, and we thought, let's compare it. Yes? So one question about this. Uh, production possibility frontiers for the two individuals. I mean, uh, is there a reason why they are not completely linear? They are, you know, a little bit non-linear there. But what was the, what was the objective? Uh, of that? We're creating an environment where what they can discover is that uh, <coughs> they can uh, fully spe uh, specialize, and there's uh, there's economies for, for the person who can produce produce blue best. There's economies, and it pays him to, to produce everything. But if he produces all blue and doesn't trade, he gets zero because he has to consume these in fixed proportions. So uh, we create a situation where it's very risky to specialize and not trade. And so that in a, in a, there's, a, there's a sense, you see, in which that makes it hard. And, and they, they have to, <clears throat> and of course, what they off, what they typically do is not fully specialize. Even it, it takes them a while to actually learn that. So they'll hedge by producing some of each, and then maybe uh, try out the possibility of trade. Although they don't typically call it trade. Okay, we'll talk about. We'll pretty soon we'll talk about the the, the words they use. <laughs> about being known as having founded a field is it's uh, important to live longer than the other founders. <laughs> okay, and I think uh, the, the other founders
founder who uh, really influenced me a lot was Sidney Siegel. How many people here have ever heard of Sidney Siegel? Sidney which? Sidney Siegel. Siegel. Yes. Well, he, he was one of the founders of experimental economics. The thing is, uh, he died at age 45, and so that didn't, that didn't help him. Well, I want to talk about. <clears throat> uh, Let me just check on the buttons here. Okay. <coughs> uh, I want to talk about a special, uh, specialization, exchange, and property rights. Uh, somehow, your ancestors and mine discovered those three things. Simultaneous. Uh, if you think about it, you you can't have one very effectively without the other. Uh, the uh, and, and so this started as a my colleague Bart Wilson and I were discussing the fact that that experiments and economics tend to be uh, to have a pretty hot pretty substantial structure that comes typically from economic theory or a situation that is believed to be uh, uh, well understood. And, and, and the question here is, uh, how might these three things be discovered simultaneously? And how do you create an environment where people have to discover them? We don't, we give them very little information, sparse instructions at all tell you about shortly, uh, but put them in an, an environment where they can do much better if they learn to specialize, uh, exchange, and part of that is having some kind of a property rights system, which we don't, and we don't, the experimenters don't enforce any property rights from the outside. Uh, the uh, we study what has become known as uh, virtual economies in, in which people are, are informed only of their preferences so they know how they can make money. The uh, actions that they can take are very, uh, uh, very free-ranging. Essentially, they use natural language, written language, to communicate. And they essentially have to figure out what to, what to do and how to do it. Uh, <clears throat> the traditional economics experiments, as, ma as many of you know, creates not only an environment where people can, can gain, can profit by, uh, by taking actions in the experiment, but also uh, we typically provide them with some kind of an institution which defines whatever their message space is and how it is that messages uh, map into and become outcomes that, that from which they can uh, uh, profit. And here, here's just a typical example using a supply and demand market. But even <clears throat> take a simple extensive form game. Uh, the payoffs to define the motivation the structure, the, the institution is in the series of moves and the structure of those moves. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, environment that our subjects are in are, are illustrated by this uh, virtual economy, this interface. And what they can do, they've got 10 seconds uh, at the beginning of every period, and they set a, a, a little, uh, they can adjust up here this, this pointer, and that determines how much red and blue they can produce. Okay? And they also have a payoff structure for the red and blue. I'll show you the standard uh, Edgeworth box form of it here uh, shortly. So they decide how much red and blue to produce in the first 10 seconds. And then they go into the regular e experiment. And what can they do? They can talk. And they can move red and blue around. Okay? 
Uh, here's here's uh, the instructions are essentially about two thirds of a page long. Okay, and they're told that when the the clock it, there's first the ten second first ten seconds which I've left out here where they produce the red and blue. Then they're told that when the clock expires over the next ninety second period. You earn cash based upon the number of red and blue items that have been moved to your house. We don't tell them that they have to move them. We don't tell them that it's possible for other people to move stuff into their house that, to discover that. So the point is that what it means to move stuff, uh, they're going to be paid based upon the number of units of red and blue moved into their house by the end of the period. Okay. But what that process is and what, how much freedom that gives them, they have to discover by trial and error, by conversation. Okay. Everyone, and they're told that everyone in this experiment can send text messages. Every, everyone can read all posted messages. You send the screen, you can type a message in the chat room, click on the, on the, on the send button, and that sends it to the screen where everybody can see it. Okay. And during the experiment, every seven periods will be a break period in which nobody produces anything, but the chat rooms are still open. Okay, here's the, here are the production opportunity sets uh, of a even, uh, Here's an even fr the even frontier. Person with an even number has this al these alternative amounts of red and blue that he can produce. A people an, an odd individual can produce these uh, alternative uh, amounts. Uh, <coughs> notice that there's and there's economies that's going to pay them to to fully specialize. Okay, and either blue or red, but they have to find that out. Uh, <coughs> Then uh, evens, uh, they have Leontief preferences, okay? So they're going to consume red and blue in fixed proportions. The, uh, the evens, it's two to one, and, and the reds, it's uh, three to two, okay? If they specialize, they can, what they have to discover is that if I, the, an odd specializing in red needs to find out that he can trade 30 blue, 40 red for 30 blue, and if, if he pairs up with an even that is fully specialized, then uh, the, the ratio is just the reverse of that. Okay, now I'm going to show you. <clears throat> uh, we started out, and we thought, let's compare it. Yes? So one question about this. Uh, production possibility frontiers for the two individuals. I mean, uh, is there a reason why they are not completely linear? They are, you know, a little bit non-linear there. But what was the, what was the objective? Uh, of that? We're creating an environment where what they can discover is that uh, <coughs> they can uh, fully spe uh, specialize, and there's uh, there's economies for, for the person who can produce produce blue best. There's economies, and it pays him to, to produce everything. But if he produces all blue and doesn't trade, he gets zero because he has to consume these in fixed proportions. So uh, we create a situation where it's very risky to specialize and not trade. And so that in a, in, there's, a, there's a sense, you see, in which that makes it hard. And, and they, they have to, <clears throat> and of course, what they off, what they typically do is not fully specialized. Even it, it takes them a while to actually learn that. So they'll hedge by producing some of each, and then maybe uh, try out the possibility of trade. Although they don't typically call it trade. Okay, we'll talk about. We'll pretty soon we'll talk about the the, the words they use. Everybody was born equal in making tools. And very likely the special ed specialization like that. Well, tool making goes back 3.4 million years. Okay, so we're talking about a process that nobody could write down or have any idea how it came about. Uh, here, but people find them
themselves in some kind of an environment where they inter interface with each other, okay, in a tribal economy and whatever groups they lived in. And so we're putting people with a minimum of information into an unfamiliar environment, okay? Think of it that way. Uh, now, it's interesting, people, see, people, our subjects come from a world where they know both about personal social exchange, because they, they participate in that every day, and they also know about markets. They're in them all the time. Now, the question is, how do they solve this problem? Now, just thinking about it in the abstract, one of the things that we thought of, well, there'll probably be bargaining. Okay. Well, if there's bargaining, will something like a two-sided auction come out of that? All of that just likes at the fancy. Once we started to make these observations, we, we realized how wrong-headed that was as a way of thinking about how, how people would solve this problem. It's just incredible how much you can change your thinking by doing something, uh, looking at some ch challenging environment with it that nobody has modeled and we don't have any experience in. Uh, and, and we all tend, but being victims of our education, we imagine what it must like go going to be like before we make those observations. Okay, so I'm just telling you how much we've learned since we started this about six or seven years ago. Uh, Excuse me? Yes. When the subject started to discover the exchange pro process, do they, do they always continue uh, trading with only one uh, yes, partner? Sure. Or do they, do they yes. uh, try to explore yes. other? Those bilateral pairs are rock hard. They can't do anything. <laughs> and why not? <laughs> it's the way the pairs see that relationship. Okay? That they can't be invaded. It isn't there. It isn't because there isn't some attempt to. I have another question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Now our bill of treatment. Remember, our postulate is that uh, the problem in the sessions of size eight is that people spend too much time trying to get a match and not enough time developing a relationship. That's a whole lot less of a problem if you're in an economy of size two. And the fours did a little better. Well, what's going on there is there's, a, there's, few, there's more ideas about what you might do. And also, not some, for, for any one individual, not so many people that you might pair with. Okay? When you get to eight, then people worry too much about getting paired, and it turns out that's not the way you solve this problem. At least that was our conjecture. So we go over now to Build 8, where we start out <coughs> with, and I'm going to show you six sessions, uh, where you've got eight people in the room, and so there's four economies of size two. They're together for three weeks, okay, for half the experiment. <coughs> then we, at, at random, Combine the eight, the four pairs into two groups of size four, and for half the period that's left, they operate in, in a group of size four. Then we put them all together into one. Now you see that gives them a chance to form pairs, and then enlarge the group over time. And our conjecture was that this, the build date would kind of solve the problem that we got when we looked at economies of size eight. Uh, Oh, and you note, notice here, we don't do anything to enforce contracts. If they have an agreement, neither of them has to fulfill that agreement, so far as any external sanctions that we impose. Okay? But it is a repeated game, and it goes over a, a long enough period that that, has, that clearly has a, a substantial chance to do its work. Okay, here's... Uh, Here's uh, uh, Bill Day, and you can see now that the economies of size eight, and there's six of them that build up from two to eight, okay? Six different independent groups. 
Oh, they're doing this. And now this is doing much better than our economies of size eight, where they started out as a group of eight and had to, had to work it out over time. And in fact, we only have one here that really strikes out. <clears throat> All the others by the end are starting to get there. Okay. Uh, okay, now here's a response to the question about bilateralism or the pairs. How firm are they? Okay. So this session starts out, this is period uh, 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 33. Okay, so they're all already up to a group of size uh, uh, eight. Uh, so we have five producers, 130 red, six, six red, and 62 blue. This guy's not specializing, seven and eight specialized. Okay, uh, so that's what they did at the beginning of that period. A, at the A part is when they produce their red and blue. B says, uh, five says, I think eight and I would be the best match actually. We have the highest numbers. Seven says, I'm tied with you for that pie. And we've been trading, me and he and the guy that came in, we've been trading for some time. And one says, well then, let's all pick partners. Okay, eight, if you can, work with me. Eight, what's your ratio? One to two. One red for, for blues? What, what is yours? Oh, I, blue for red. Five, what's your ratio? One blue for reds. His, his ratio is the same as set eight or seven says eight. His ratio is the same as mine. I see. You have no advantage. Switching to him, and he says, "Killing it." So that's you see. That's the kind of thing that happens if someone once a pair is formed and they try to get in. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the words they use, they don't very often use the word. The typical word is give. You give me blue, I'll give you red. Okay. Words like share, help, team, split, partner together, all those words are pretty small. So it's... <clears throat> now, uh, I want to turn now to the property question. <clears throat> Remember, we don't force contracts, but... There were property rights in that experiment, uh, and so we're, we're going to relax those. Uh, uh, Hume postulated that the development of the conventions of justice produced the institution of property, which consists of three fundamental laws of nature. The stability of possession is transferred by content, consent and the performance of promises. Uh, it is on the strict observance these three laws that the peace and security of human society entirely depend. Or is there any possibility of establishing a good correspondence among men where these are neglected? So, what we, <clears throat> uh, one day I told Bart, I said, you know, we don't enforce contracts, but you can't go into somebody else's house and take anything. Uh, so we respecified the actions and the instructions. So in all these sessions so far, subjects can discover, but they're not told that they can move, that is put, items in each other's homes. <clears throat> now in the new sessions I'm going to show you, subjects can also discover that they can move items into or, or move items out of each other's homes. So they can either put or take. Now, so far as an exchange is concerned, does, for a trade, it doesn't make a difference whether I give you a uh, red and you give me blue, or you take the red and I take the blue. Uh, it's a trade either way. But let's look at the difference. Uh, this is just the same uh, interface I showed you before, except it's for four. Okay, and that's to move them into your house, or you can you can actually move go into somebody's house and take it. But they have to discover. We don't tell them anything. You have to discover what they call steal, just as they have to discover what they call give, mutual giving or trade. Uh, <clears throat> so here's three uh, uh, 
three uh, sessions, and we call it Steel A. No, we don't call it Steel and Instructions. That's what they call it. Okay. Uh, they quit like, if you come in and take some things out of my house, I very soon express the word steel is used in the classroom, in, in the chat room, okay? Uh, theft tends, generally tends to delay, to delay discovery of specialization and exchange. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the compare uh, the uh, economies where they can only move into with the ones here where they can either either put or or take. Uh, taking out of other people's houses starts early earlier than 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 the process of giving in each other's houses. Uh, also, if you look at those economies that do well, they're talking early before the stealing starts. Okay, just general uh, characteristic. And chat rooms are filled up with pleas to stop stealing. And this is the one time when you see uh, uppercase letters used in words when they talk about stealing. Those are all uppercase, those tend to be uppercase words. Uh, <clears throat> now, so, so, so what was yes. the uh, equilibrium amount of stealing at the end? Like, how much of the actual output was stolen by the subject? It's in the data, but I can't answer it. No. Uh, well, if they look, I can even if I if I enter your house, your house at the very end of the period, I can grab all of your stuff, and you don't even have it. You don't even reach off and on to that. Okay. Yeah. So it's zero. <laughs> Is there a <coughs> trade-off between wealth creation and wealth redistribution in that? Say, while well, if you spend time on stealing, then you can spend time on production. Oh, yes. And that's the problem. There's opportunity cost. Because and this is one of the things. There's a slider there between production of red and blue, right? So instead, yes. you don't have to spend. Time. Well, they do that. The, the red and blue is produced at the beginning, first yeah. 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, so there, there's. They, they, can produce, they, can, they could, uh, I suppose, protest the theft by not producing. One of the things they do is say, why should we trade? Because it's stealing, because of the staff. Anyway, uh, now, Cassidy refers to, uh, you take my red, I'll take your blue. He refers to that as steel trading. It's sometimes called tolerated theft. Uh, as he points out, it differs from borrowing and that the one acquiring the item does not return it and it differs from stealing in that the course of action is condoned. And it's different from gift giving in that the item is not given but appropriated by the person acquiring it. Okay, so, and, and he mentions the Easter Island case where there was explicit uh, con uh, condoning under, under island law of what you might call tolerated theft as a way of, of uh, trading. Uh, Here's the game of steel. Person one, it's not cool. Four, it's not made. It's person three, I think. Three, it's four. Let's trade, not steal. Only 90 red and 30 blues, and I'm happy. Three, same here. So other than that, take the rest of my red and leave the 90. Uh, person two, yeah, let me have eight, four, uh, 80 blue, 40 red. Are you kidding? He's just moved the, you see what's happened here. Person two says that and then moves 60 red from Tree's house into his own house. <laughs> and three, are you kidding? What happened? It's person four. <coughs> Was there a theft from your house? Guys, uh, guys, he took it from you. I'm <laughs> It's cool. Of course, that's, uh, of course, and it says it's person two. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, uh, and let's see, is this the next period? Yeah, 29, 30, here's the same section. Okay, one says, everyone produce your own from now on. Let's stop trade or we won't make any money. Are you sure? Yeah, because people keep stealing. Well, if no trade, 
Well, if no one steals, let's ask. I guess the ideal situation, though, or give. Odd numbers do red and even numbers do blue. Uh, and then right away we have theft. I'm tired of this. Stop taking things from each other's homes. If people are greedy, no one gets any. Well, someone, but only one. <laughs> <laughs> only one person uh, wins, that's when the revolution starts. <laughs> I think the point is to cooperate. And the guy says, and the burning. What's going on? Stop working in the White House. So, and then here's the cap, all caps, stop stealing. Uh, um, this is in session five, six. Everyone can win here. Seven, if you people work together, you'll get more money. Six, got it? I'm in. This is sort of not working. Someone not cooperating. It's two. And it looks like two. Yo, number two, what's the deal? Uh, six, one, four, come on, guys. Seven, one, cooperate, two. I'm trying to make sense of it. You can all make money here for your good. Like you said, it would make sense to split production. Okay, everyone makes a certain ratio. Yeah, I started with all this greed. Two finally confesses. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then, what so you it? make, seven says, so you it? make what you can most of and split it up. Okay, everyone, one stop. Let's try this. Everyone makes more money this way. So, so that, that's that's the, the general uh, uh, drift of those groups that that succeed. They 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 solve it. <clears throat> uh, they either fail to solve it, or they solve it by um, overcoming the. Uh, person or able, getting able to turn around the one or two people that are doing uh, the, the theft. And it only takes one in a group of eight, and it just creates havoc, okay? And it's this opportunity cost, you see, uh, that's very high. Uh, <clears throat> now, this led us... to pose the question, okay, now, we, we have a, an environment where some of the groups are able to overcome theft and, and achieve a, a fairly efficient uh, level of, of, uh, of production uh, and exchange. Uh, then the question that we wanted to address using this framework was how a group might go from, from solving locally the, the specialization exchange problem to uh, trade between villages. And we did this by so uh, the question uh, we're going to do this by putting people through two different kinds of learning experiences. Build up a, a, a pool of subjects that have been in the environment where you can't take, and another group of subjects that, that, have, that get all, and this is all the build aid environment. Uh, that are only exposed to the give plus take environment. So we've got a, a, a group of subjects that have had historical property right experience and a group of subjects that, that have not. And then we're going to put them into uh, an environment where there will be three goods. Now they're all, so now they're all trained in an environment where there's, two, there's just the two goods, red and blue. Now we're going to put an environment where there's a third good. They had historical property right experience and a group of subjects that, that have not. And then we're going to put them into uh, an environment where there will be three goods. Now they're all, so now they're all trained in an environment where there's, two, there's just the two goods, red and blue. Now we're going to put an environment where there's a third good. Uh, if you're in a 
red-blue village, then the third good is pink. If you're in a red-pink village, then the third good is blue. And then there'll be a third village with the other, other property. So we're going to set the stage, you see here, for something that you can call long-distance trade. <coughs> Uh, and here's an example. This shows you a, a four-person <clears throat> economy that produces red and blue. But in their payoff function, there's this pink. What's this pink? All they know is that if they have it, it leverages the payoff from red and blue. In fact, it, it, it comes in as a multiplier. In fact, you see for this... Uh, for this, in the red-blue village, the pink uh, multiplier is 1.7. So if they, if they get the, uh, if, if they reach the red-blue optimum, then, and they get the pink, that's a multiplier to the payoff that they get from the red and blue. And the red and blue, of course, is what they've had experience with. Uh, in their in their training sessions, uh, <clears throat> and then over here on the right, this is a, a, a an economy of size four. T two of these uh, two of these guys are producers only, and they're exactly like the environment they were trained in. The other two over here on, on the right, they have half the production capacity and ability at, uh, at one and two. But they also have the capacity to travel, and they have a bucket. And there's nothing in the instructions that tells them what the bucket's for. They have to click on the travel button and go, and when they do that, they will come to, uh, <clears throat> think of it as a fairground, okay, and the, and the other uh, merchants can come there from their village. Uh, and, and each of these has a chat room. There's a chat room in your village, and then the merchants have a chat room. Uh, so here's a red-blue village, day 14. Uh, person one. Okay, four, 55 blues. I can make 130 red, usually, which is what I've been doing. Correction, 110 blues. All right, wait. Okay, what about three and four? What are these paints for? I can actually make 130 red. He's correct. Pinks are a multiplier. Okay, so 110 plus 55 is 165 blues. The pinks multiply properly. Yeah. Three. How many reds can you make? Seven. How can I increase it? Well, 70 plus 130 is 200 red. The production scroller on the top. <laughs> He's told me how to do it up there. Okay. <laughs> You see, if the other guy doesn't get it, then you're not. Then that reduces your capacity to do well, and they're and they're they're finding that. Uh, okay, one and three need more red than blue. Two of us can make more reds, and two can make more blue. We need extra blues to trade for pinks also. What should we change for next round? Then we can exchange if required. One and three maximize red. I'm already at red producing max. Me and four will max. Uh, blue. Okay. Okay. Three. Got it? <laughs> so here's the... <clears throat> and then here's... Uh, let's see, that's 14. Let's see. Here's... This shows you sometimes the kind of, of chit-chat that goes on. Well, let me get real, man. Uh, where are you at? Yo, who do you know is the businessman? Ten says ten. No. I got these great deals, those meal uh, deals. If I had that bucket, I would have bankrupt every other chat room. Do something, doing all that typing, and so on. So there's a, this is the kind of thing that goes on uh, uh, sometimes in the village chat room. If you look at the merchant area, area it's very sparse. Any things for red? Yeah, I got it. How many? I need five red. Pinks, please. Person eight, what do you want? Can I get some pinks? Uh, eight red. Seven pinks for seven blues? Actually, that's the world price of reds, pinks, and blues is one for one. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the 
They're clearly lack idle chit chat. They're filled with price quotes, 20 for 20, 7 for 7. The merchants arrive at the area, they make their deals, and return to their village community. The cooperation in the merchant area is implicit. When I give you 20 pinks, you give 20 blues, you and I will be better off. There's no discussion of how consumption generates earnings, nor is it transparent how we will be, be better off, we, with the transaction. They don't talk about payoffs, and they often will share that information in the village. <clears throat> and by the way, I, you know, we've tried all kinds of things that I'm not going to have time to talk to you about today. And some of our greatest learning has to do with the stuff we thought would work and didn't. Okay. And one of the things we thought, well, uh, let's try a treatment well where we don't start the merchants in the villages. Let's start the merchants in their own area. Okay, so that they, they, they get to know each other. Make, make that more personal. That worked. But the problem is the villages won't take them. If you're not a merchant within that village, you're in trouble in terms of, of overcoming the, uh, <clears throat> the resistance to trade. Okay, here's, uh, we're looking here now at the impact of history on wealth. I'll put them both up. On the left is the property rights history. All the subjects in these uh, sessions uh, came from uh, the build aid treatment where they had uh, uh, a, uh, no one could come into their house and take it. Okay? And the ones on the right, there's no property rights. Notice here that the <clears throat> this level here, that's the village competitive equilibrium with no interbellage trade. So if each, if each village does the best for itself, but they don't trade among the villages, they'll all, so all be up here, okay? None of these reach that level, whereas almost all of these, all but one, uh, surged above that with where they have a property rights history. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the yellow bars tell you how much the merchants are making. The others are the blue bars are telling you how much the, the producers are uh, the one of the things that comes out of this is out of this is that the more productive and efficient economies also have a better distribution of income. Okay, <clears throat> a more equal. That's not necessarily better, but they see it. That that's the way they they work out the the uh, uh, arrangement. Here's a if you look at the. Incidents of the use of the word we 